So for this afternoon's 3CL seminar, our last of the academic year, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Richard Booth, who is Martin G. McGinn Chair in Business Law at Villanova University. Uh, Professor Booth uh, has uh, formerly been a member of the faculty at a number of institutions, including the University of Maryland, Southern Methodist University, and also Case Western University. He's also formerly practiced corporate and securities litigation and teaches corporate finance, business planning, venture capital and securities litigation. And the topic of Professor Booth's paper this afternoon is the real problem with appraisal arbitrage. So, Professor Booth. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for inviting me to, um, uh, to give this seminar. Um, it's a, this is a topic that is, um, I, I think, peculiarly um, American. It's, uh, it's, it's not something, uh, in terms of the law, it's not something that is um, likely to arise in the same form in, in many other countries, I don't think. I don't know about Canada for sure, but I doubt that um, uh, there's a practice that this is um, there's a direct uh, corollary under UK or, or Scottish law, uh, for that matter. But anyway, it, it really it starts with um, the, uh, the 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 right of dissent and appraisal under United States corporation law, and um, it's um, uh, in in most of these cases, as with all corporate law cases, arise in Delaware. And Delaware, as it turns out, has a has a peculiar sort of appraisal remedy. Um, but but every state, as far as I know, I mean, if there are any exceptions, I'd be surprised. Um, every U.S. state has some kind of appraisal remedy. So, um, in essence, the appraisal remedy allows a target stockholder who uh, either votes no or abstains in connection with a fundamental transaction, like a merger, sale of assets, or whatever, um, to um, formally say, I don't like the price, uh, and after a, a procedure of perfecting one's rights, you can then have um, a court uh, decide what the price ought to be, that is, determine what the fair price is. And in both Delaware and under the Model Act, the Model Act applies to roughly 35, I mean, more or less applies in, say, 35 or so of the 50 states, um, not in Delaware. Delaware you know, makes up its own law. Um, but um, in both of these jurisdictions, um, the, the rule is that the dissenting stockholder is entitled to fair value, which is distinct from fair market value. So the statute itself, and certainly case law in the meantime, has, um, has made a distinction between fair market value and fair value. Um, and I think the best way to think of fair value, I don't want to get too deeply into that because that's not really central to this thing uh, or, or to my thesis here, uh, but the best way to think about what fair value is is that it's um, a, a price that is determined with respect to an unwilling seller. So fair market value is often said to be willing seller, willing buyer, um, but given that um, appraisal is a remedy for stockholders who dissent from the transaction. Um, they've more or less declared themselves to be unwilling buyers. The presumption is they would prefer to keep their shares as opposed to um, selling them. So the courts quite clearly um, have developed a, uh, a system of valuation that focuses on shareholders um, who, are, who, who object to the transaction. And so it's a different standard of value. Um, Though, we'll get to this later, there's, uh, there are some cases in which arguably fair market value has, has crept back in, we'll talk about that. In any event, in Delaware, um, and that's why I've got this slide, Washington crossing Delaware here, although that's kind of misleading because he crossed the Delaware from Pennsylvania to New Jersey, but that has, uh, which is right next to Delaware, that's got, we can talk about the history of it, and that's actually relevant if you want to. In any event, um, in Delaware, the appraisal remedy arises only in connection with mergers. Um, 
in, under the Model Act, the appraisal remedy arises in any fundamental transaction. So any, any, any transaction in which a stockholder can be forced to sell, including uh, mergers as well as uh, sale of asset transactions and um, uh, uh, stock exchange transactions, which are, are very, I don't think happen very often, but they're, they are theoretically doable. But oddly enough, Delaware makes a distinction between mergers and any other way in which a company can get sold out from under uh, the stockholders forcibly. So even though the stockholders have a vote on a sale of assets transaction, they don't have an appraisal remedy for that sort of uh, transaction. And I'm not sure what the thinking is about that in any event. One, thing, one question that this um, raises is why, was any, why would anybody do a merger under Delaware law given that the stockholders get an extra remedy uh, when you can avoid giving the stockholders that remedy by doing the transaction in the form of a sale of assets. Nevertheless, mergers are, are um, maybe are probably more common than sales of assets. So the, 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 for some reason, the parties are willing um, uh, to trigger this thing. All right, so that's the appraisal remedy um, in short. Um, there is, as I uh, sort of allude to here, one kind of merger situation where Delaware does not give the appraisal remedy, and that's where both companies involved are publicly traded in the, in the transaction. It's a stock for stock transaction. So that's, that's the one exception. Um, under the Model Act, the, um, uh, the remedy applies in theory to all sorts of transactions, but it doesn't apply unless the transaction is um, conflicted. Unless the surviving, unless a stock, unless an existing stockholder will own 20% or more, um, that is, an existing 20% or more stockholder um, will own a similar interest in the surviving company. So under under uh, the Model Act, it's you don't get appraisal unless there's a conflict in the transaction. Um, all right. So anyway, under Delaware law, um, what the um, what has happened um, is that um, I think there's is that uh, <coughs> this seems to be going forward instead of backwards. Um, I see. Is that hedge funds have started buying shares of um, target companies after the deals are announced and right up until the vote is taken on the transaction. And they've started buying the shares for purposes of asserting appraisal rights. Um, now, one might think that, um, uh, that the courts would react to that and say, well, that's not what appraisal rights are for because appraisal rights sort of have this history of, of being um, uh, protection for dissenting uh, stockholders. So, you know, why would a hedge fund who actually buys into the claim uh, be able, or why should we let a hedge fund who buys into the claim assert those rights? In any event, the Delaware courts have said, well, the statute says what the statute says, and it says that anybody who perfects their rights and does so before the vote is taken, and to, prefer, to perfect your rights, all you have to do is say, I'm going to assert my appraisal rights. You don't have to say how many shares you have. So anybody who does that can, um, uh, can assert their appraisal rights, even if the shares that they bought were bought after the deal was, was announced and conceivably even after the deal was approved. Because after the vote happens, there's still a period of time where the shares, um, uh, where the shares are traded. Um, and there's, there's no minimum ownership threshold to assert? No, actually, rights? well, there is, but it's very low. Um, it's, uh, and, and it was only recently added, um, and it's something like a million dollars worth of shares. Right. So it's, uh, it's not, even in, not even in percentage terms. So it's a, a, there's a de minimis requirement um, that, that at least a million dollars worth of shares to send from the transaction. And if so, you're, um, uh, you're fine. And that's, you know, that's, that's really um, next, to, uh, next to nothing. So the question is, why has appraisal arbitrage um, uh, come to the fore? Uh, that is, why, why do we have 
Why is this happening all of a sudden? And to what extent is it happening? And although I've got several graphs here, I did not you know, generate these graphs. Um, uh, Meyer Myers and Charles Cosmo uh, did this, but I think this is the most, um, uh, the most telling of the graphs. And it shows that since 2004, that was a period of, they studied 130 or so uh, appraisal transactions, or appraisal um, proceedings, um, beginning in about 2011, actually, uh, the number of, of transactions that were challenged under the appraisal revenue shot up dramatically. So that at this point, uh, something in excess that their numbers only go through 2013, but I can vouch for the fact that 14, 15, and 16 are similar, if not more dramatic. Um, the, um, uh, something between 15 and 20 percent, something like 17 percent, of all transactions in which appraisal rights were available, uh, the appraisal rights were asserted. And this is mostly um, in response to, or most of these cases um, are uh, appraisal arbitrage cases. Um, this is actually also an interesting graph in the sense that um, it shows in the, the light gray line um, are, is the percentage of transactions that are challenged um, in any way with, uh, it, by means of litigation. Um, and you see that in the last couple of years here, uh, the number, which is on the left-hand scale, is virtually every transaction, which is a, a, a wholly different kind of abuse. But I think as you see, the present transactions have tracked that increase in litigation, although um, uh, with a bit of a lag, something like a two-year lag. Now, a lot of these other transactions, or these other um, Lawsuits that are being brought are being uh, are being are, are really being brought for their settlement value. Many of them are settled are settled simply for additional disclosure, so to generate fees for the firms. But the difference, and we might talk about this if you find it interesting, um, is that in an appraisal case, in order to seek appraisal, uh, in order to assert your appraisal rights, you actually have to put your money where your mouth is and buy the shares. Um, I suppose it's possible that there are, you know, you can hedge in various ways, but um, uh, that's not necessary with respect to other forms of litigation which are asserting, you know, on behalf of all the stockholders that, uh, that there has been inadequate disclosure. So anyway, the real question is, um, what explains this increase in appraisal? Um, and there have been, as I kind of discuss at length in the article, and, and really I'm hoping to get beyond the article before we finish up with this presentation. Um, there have been several different uh, theories suggested as to why appraisal arbitrage has become um, so attractive. Now, obviously, the ultimate explanation is that hedge funds make money doing this. Um, and to jump a, a ways forward, um, Myers and Korsman found that uh, the average premium that one gets in an appraisal proceeding is about 50% over the deal price. And again, those are only for, that's only for the shareholders who have dissented and sought their appraisal rights. That number actually, as it turns out, is a little bit low. I did a different, um, a separate study of um, cases since about uh, 2000. Well, actually, since the early 1990s, um, and found that um, uh, in a, a selection of cases where there has been debate about the, the growth rate of the company, uh, that is, where, the, where that's been litigated to the extent that it, a discussion of it appears in uh, the case, the premium is more like is more like 75 percent, um, and if you uh, eliminate the cases where there have been there has been no um, conflict in the transaction, and the courts have said that deal price doesn't is in fact fair price, then you look only at the cases that where there is a perceived conflict between the buyer who you know is taking you know. For, presumptively taking advantage of the situation. The, the premium is actually more on the order of 
So you, so the dissenters in cases in which the, um, uh, in, in cases in which the there's a conflict in the transaction, have doubled their money um, compared to what the uh, compared to deal price. And deal price itself may reflect something of the premium, but in essence, you get twice as much. You get a hundred percent. But what pushes a hundred percent premium over deal price as a result of seeking appraisal rights. So the question is, um, or asserting appraisal rights, the question is, where does that money come from? Why is it that the courts are ordering twice as much, uh, payments of twice as much when people assert their appraisal rights as, as is being found in the deal? Well, anyway, a number of, um, of scholars have, have looked into this and have, have come up with uh, a total of I guess four explanations. One is that this sort of relies on option pricing theory, and the idea is that there's a free option involved. Uh, that is, you get to you, you have the right to assert these rights, and you can you can opt out even if you declare that you're going to dissent. You can withdraw the petition for 120 days after the transaction happens. So you get a free option to either assert your right to to challenge the price or not, um, all the way through the run-up to the actual execution of the transaction for 120 days afterwards. Um, that's one explanation. Another is that Delaware awards too much prejudgment interest. They award prejudgment interest at 5% over the Federal Reserve discount rate, uh, which is better than you can do with a bond, um, a long-term government bond. Um, another argument is that the Delaware courts have been applying a too low discount rate um, when, they dis when they determine what the value of the company is. And here there's a little bit of a debate going on um, as to whether or not the historical rate, that is the average discount, the average rate of return that you get on stocks since 1925, uh, which is you know, getting close to 100 years now, uh, whether that average should be used, or which, as it turns out, is something on the order of 11%, uh, which has been the average um, annual return on stock, on U.S. stocks. Um, should we use that rate, or uh, should we adjust that rate to the extent that we have reason to believe that rates in the, or that rates of return in the future are going to be lower, uh, and the and the courts, have, the Delaware courts, have basically have pretty much at this point settled on what they call the supply side rate, that is the lower rate that reflects um, reduced returns going forward. Um, but that lower rate is not that much lower. That's maybe. 60 basis points or something like that. It's or, or, I mean, let's give it, even, even if you say that the, that the supply side rate is going to be, say, 10% rather than 11%, it's not going to be, it's not a huge difference. And I've added another bullet here, which is maybe nobody would have thought of doing appraisal arbitrage before. That is, the opportunity was always there, but, um, but nobody, ever, nobody would have thought of doing it. I think that the most, ex the, the most likely explanation um, for why this has happened is not any of these four, uh, but rather uh, that the, uh, the courts have uh, presumed uh, that, um, that corporations will grow in value um, over the long haul more than they should justifiably um, uh, do. Uh, and here we have to get it kind of into the weeds of, of valuation. It's, um, uh, but I, I'll try not to get too far into it because um, I, mean, I, I, I don't know how much you guys know about this stuff or how much you sort of play with it, but um, in essence, the, the essential um, uh, formula for valuing a company, and this is extremely simple, 
is that value is equal to the annual return divided by what I like to call the required rate of return. Um, and the required rate of return on the average is what, uh, what stockholders expect to get from stocks, which historically has been about 11%, um, but arguably maybe should be more like um, 10%. So you can figure out the value of a company if, you, if, if, if the annual return is level, um, and which is a, a big if, because it's not usually that way. Um, but assuming that it is, the value of the company is equal to the annual return divided by the discount rate, which is, in essence, the required rate of return. Now, the problem with that formula, historically, the courts in Delaware did this, and they measured annual return by an average of rear view earnings as reported under GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles. Um, so historically, this was really quite accurate. Um, the problem that the courts had, even, even in the old days, before 1983, and the reason that old days stopped in 1983 is that there was this landmark decision, Weinberger versus UOP, in which the court changed basically the law of everything as it relates to both um, conflicted mergers and uh, the appraisal remedy. And so since 1983, the law has, has taken a different um, tack. In any event, the, the historical problem was that um, most companies tend to grow. That is, uh, annual returns tend to rise a little bit every year. Um, there are some other problems, too, and that is that returns tend to be volatile. So using an average may, uh, may be problematic if, if, if there's um, you know, important discrepancies between the fact that you know, a big chunk of money is coming sooner rather than later and so forth. Um, and there's also the problem of accounting conventions, which can vary from company to company. You may have one company that uses LIFO, another one uses FIFO. And so how do you, you know, compare those companies? Using the annual return completely ignores those discrepancies. So there are a lot of problems with that old formula. In any event, going back to the old formula um, and focusing only on the growth thing, um, it turns out that you can, you can adjust for growth by subtracting from the required rate of return the rate of growth uh, in returns um, expect, that the company is expected to generate. So, for instance, if the, rate, if the required rate of return is 10%, that is the discount rate is 10%, and the company is expected to increase in, that its, re, its returns are expected to increase year to year to year by, say, 5%, you would divide the return not by 10%, but rather by 10% minus 5%. And by reducing the total discount rate, you, the value of the company ends up being greater. Um, and I've got an example which I think will maybe help to show this and, and show in a way also. Um, why it's wrong, but in any event, the courts, sort of, sort of the punchline in a way, is that since about 2010, the courts have been applying growth rates in, in these cases uh, that are as high as 5%, in fact, 5.5% in one case. Well, if you're gonna have, if the discount rate that you're starting out with is, just to round it, let's call it 10%. If the discount rate is 10% and you're going to adjust that discount rate down to 5% because of expected growth, the value of the company is going to double. Um, and, to, and, and my theory, which I'm going to sort of think now try to backfill, is that the courts have been way overestimating the rate of growth. Uh, that companies can expect going forward. Um, so, and again, as I say, I mean, I'm tempted to put it, like we in the States have, do you guys have, have to deal with trigger warnings here? When you, have, when you discuss something that's likely to upset the audience, um, I, I'm tempted to say that getting into this much math deserves a trigger <laughs> warning. Uh, but, um, I, you know, I can't, I can't avoid it. Anyway, the, the monologue of what I was referring to before of, of subtracting the growth rate from the discount rate is named for this guy, Myron Gordon. 
it's sometimes referred to as the Gordon, uh, it's usually referred to as the Gordon growth model. Most people have dropped the word dividend, uh, but that turns out to be a crucial omission. In any event, the Gordon growth model is mentioned quite frequently in Delaware appraisal cases uh, with respect to uh, this, uh, this adjustment for growth. But here now is the, in a way, uh, the, um, this is the example I promised earlier. Um, and I think it kind of pulls the rug out from under uh, the whole thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm basically going through the, uh, the calculation that we were discussing earlier. Acme Blasting Cap Corporation. Uh, let's assume that it generates an annual return of $1,000 a year and it has a required rate of return, a discount rate of 10%. Um, skip these couple of lines. Um, the straightforward application of the valuation formula suggests that, that Acme is worth $10,000 in the aggregate because $1,000 a year divided by 0.10 is equal to 10000 now, Acme has decided um, that they want to grow the returns of the company um, by reinvesting some of what's available. Um, and they've decided that they want to grow at a, return, at, at a rate of 5% a year. What would that require? That requires, if, if you want to increase the $1,000 return, by 5% a year, that means you want to increase it by, by $50 a year. Um, in order to get another $50 in return, you're going to have to plow back $500 in, in available cash because $500 is what it takes to generate another $50 in return. So, so the, the, in order to grow, Acme is going to have to reduce in the dividend that it pays um, by $500. Um, so if the annual return was 1000 and they take 500 of that 1000 and plow it back into the company in order to expand sales or whatever it is, in order to generate this additional $50 a year, um, they're only going to have $500 left to distribute to the stockholders. So, what the courts have generally been doing is they've been assuming that they can adjust for growth because they expect companies to grow without also recognizing that, that the normal way of generating growth by plowing back returns um, requires you to not to distribute as much to stockholders as you used to. So if you take that 500 out, of the thousand that was available in free cash flow, um, and then you then you adjust the the required rate of return by the five percent for growth, what happens? Nothing. The, the thousand becomes a five hundred in return. The five the ten percent becomes five percent because of the expected growth. But now the formula is five hundred over 0.05 which gives you the same $10,000 valuation with growth as without, as without growth. So you might say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. You, know, you can have the, uh, um, uh, you can use either formula you want, but it's important to make the adjustment for the amount of plowback um, of the dividends. And generally speaking, so this is where, unfortunately, I get even, uh, maybe, maybe these weeds are a little deeper, maybe they're not quite as deep, I don't know. The courts have been, um, uh, well, I like this next slide, so I'm going to show it to you. Um, I think that the, the moral of that story is that growth does not grow on trees, right? Companies can grow, actually, that's, that's not quite true, but um, just to make sure that we're We've got all of the um, uh, all of the, the cards on the table here. Plowback, which is the, I mean, there there are three basic sources of, of growth that a company can um, uh, can enjoy. One is from plowback, that is taking some of what could be distributed to stockholders and reinvesting it. Um, and as we saw, arguably it doesn't make any difference in the value of the company if that's where the where the growth is coming from. 
Another possibility of growth, though, is, is rent. Uh, if a company has, is in, in, in an industry in which um, competitors find it difficult to enter, uh, or if its growth is coming from scaling up assets that, are, that other people don't already have that, can be, that, that they can scale up as well, or probably the most obvious example of, of, of a rent would be um, a patent that says that you know you can sell this product and nobody else can. So you've got uh, that's one place where you can get higher rates of return than the standard rates of return in the industry. But those kinds of returns dissipate, and the courts have recognized that. Um, so uh, you, it, what 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 happens in practice is is sometimes it, if sometimes if there's a company that has those that sort of ability. Uh, to, um, uh, to generate higher than normal returns, uh, the courts will do a kind of a two-step valuation uh, in which they uh, give you a higher, they use a, a, uh, higher returns for, say, a 10-year period during which you've got this particular competitive advantage, but then they go back to an ordinary rate of return, an ordinary level of return after that period of time. And obviously, there's, there's one other way in which companies can grow. And that is by actually thinking of something new that nobody's ever thought of before, um, even without the possibility of, um, uh, of uh, sort of being able to protect that idea. So there's a, you know, if you what about cutting costs? Um, Fire some workers or or use technology. Oh, well that, but that's it's not mean, rent. It's not innovation, unless you're calling it innovation. Other people could do that too. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's sort of the process by which, um, well, let me, let, me, let me say one other thing that I, I kind of skipped over that's, that's important to do. Um, this business about growth, okay, this business about adjusting um, the, the level of return for increases in the future. Um, in practice, what the courts in Delaware do is that they divide the the, uh, the future into two pieces. The so-called projection period for the, the immediate five years that are coming forward, that are, that are you know, a, as of the date of the merger or whatever. Um, and then the so-called terminal period for everything after that. Now during the projection period, what the courts do, what the courts have asked the parties to do in essence is to um, project year by year what their returns are going to be. So if, for example, what the company is planning to do is to reduce its workforce by 20%, um, that, is a, uh, that is an element of increased return or rate of return that would typically be reflected in this period during which the actual plans of the company are being reflected in, um, in, the, in, in the valuation. Um, but that's only, that's only the five years, the, the immediate next five years of the value of the company. You just go to the slide here that's... Um, this is actually pretty, pretty important. Um, so given this, this system, the growth thing only comes into play for the so-called terminal period. Because in the projection period, what the courts do is they, is they look at evidence as, as to the amount of returns that are going to be generated by the company year by year for five years. And that gives you one lump sum value. But companies last forever, so or theoretically may last forever. So the period from year six through infinity is called the terminal period. And the idea is we really can't predict how companies are going to, um, what they're gonna spend money on, how they're gonna cut costs, where, where, the, where the, uh, the investment is gonna go and so forth. So for the terminal period, what we're gonna do is we're going to revert back to the old system of figuring out what the rate of return is and what the likely level of growth is.
Um, you don't have to worry about that in the projection period for the first five years because what, what the courts ask companies to do ordinarily is to project year by year what the returns are going to be, reflecting those kinds of plans that the company um, might have for increasing its returns. So the growth thing really only applies to, the, uh, to this, this terminal period. But this chart, which admittedly is a little bit dense, um, breaks down at various levels of return the, the portion of the value that comes either from the first five years or every year thereafter. And as you see, just as an example, at a, um, uh, at, at, a, at a discount rate of 10%, the value of $1 for the first five years is 3.79 and change. Um, but the value of $1 for years six through forever is 6.2, about 6.21. So, um, not quite twice as, the terminal value is not quite twice as much as the projection period value, uh, but it's maybe 60%. Um, you add those two numbers together to get the value of the, total, the, of the whole company, right? The value that the stockholders should be receiving, um, or descending stockholders should be receiving. But, it, it, so, even if the courts are only adjusting the discount rate during the terminal period, um, when we don't, when we really can't talk about plans uh, in the kind of detail that, um, that we, you know, like cutting costs and so forth, even if the, the adjustment applies only during the terminal period, which is when it does, um, it can still be significant. I mean, here we've got an example of a company that's almost sixty, almost sixty percent of its value is in years six through forever. Um, and if you're going to adjust the, the required rate of return, the discount rate, by as much as 5% down from 10% during that period of time, you're going to double what that is worth, ignoring the time value, of, the five years worth of time value. But um, that number is going to be a lot higher. In fact, you can see what it would be if you just look at 5% uh, less, it would be worth, instead of being worth 6.2, it's worth 15.6. Um, and that means that the value that's being given to the um, uh, that's being given to uh, the descending stockholders is, is really much higher than it would be. So I agree. I mean, I, uh, that's a kind of a sleight of hand with respect to the question you asked. Right. Uh, I mean, no, I get it. I mean, I, I mean, my view on this. I mean, Canada, you do it through market value as your starting point. This just strikes me as hocus pocus science fiction. Yeah, like no, no. what the hell are they doing? I mean, who honestly of companies could say, "Oh, you're 12. This is what you're going to be doing." It's well, and nobody does, and nobody does. Only the first five years count. The rest. Here, let me just say. But they're I, doubling it. They're, they are implicitly saying that it's worth something past year five because they're. You know, but that's what they're doing. I mean, it's, it's just like, it's insane. Well, it's but it's the truth. Yeah, you know, sure. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, so I mean, my reaction is like, God, like, what are Delaware judges doing? I mean, I, the reason it strikes me that hedge funds are going to them is because they're appealing to the ego of these judges who think they can outguess markets. It's just preposterous. Well, here's the: there, there are a um, couple of things to say about that. First of all, what the courts have been doing: the, where do the courts get the the growth number that they get for this column? This, the number that has been as high as 5.5%, though admittedly has been scaling back a little bit. The courts have seem to yeah, be well, so. gunshot. But the, the place that they get it is from a projection of what inflation plus GDP growth is going to be. Oh, well, that, oh, of course. That's so so that's, that's, of course, quite reliable, right? Well, I mean, it's going to say, so what, the way you can test this, it's like what you should be doing is that any of these get these appraisal things, and then you should just find out how they actually did over the period. I mean, it's just going to be way over. Well, except they, they've all been taken private, and so there's no way of getting the data. Oh, I guess, yeah, I guess that's right. They're all gone. I mean, that's what happens to them. They yeah. just go They're all gone. Hole. Yeah, they go dark, so you, yeah. Can, just, yeah, you can't verify. I mean, there may be a few where there's... No, no, you're right. Yeah, they're, they're going dark. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Um, but the courts quite explicitly have, have said that we get this, this growth number, and this comes from Roger Ibbotson. The guy at um, 
who's the, the lead guru collecting all this data. His theory is that um, growth, GDP growth, comes from business. Therefore, we can look at what GDP growth is going to be and predict that that's going to be the rate of growth for the terminal period. Sure, but I mean but that doesn't that's that's a fallacy. The fact that it comes from business doesn't mean that you can presume that any given business will generate that. And let me just add one. You know, yeah, that's one fallacy, but the idea that you could even predict what GDP is going to be 6 years out it's that's, crazy. Even that's ridiculous. No, 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 that's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. Because I mean, if you knew that, I mean, you'd be, you'd be a trillionaire. Yes, clearly. Um, anyway, the, uh, it turns out, well, let me, let me just say this one other thing that we can kind of talk about, whatever piece of it you want to talk about. Um, Going back to the Gordon Growth Formula, we saw that the only way companies can predictably grow is by plowing back a portion of their cash flow. So it strikes me that a much more reasonable way of figuring out what the growth rate is going to be is to look at what the plowback rate is. And it turns out only one appraisal case in the last 15 or so years, more like 20 years, has actually discussed plowback rate. But I did some sort of gross, I mean, gross in the sense of macro uh, collection of data here. First column, the middle column here, is data for 1930 through 2016. Um, second column is just the years 2000 through 2016. Um, and, and, and this reveals some really interesting stuff. Um, for instance, the average annual price return on stocks was about 7.23, and the inflation rate of, um, and oh, the dividend return of 3.82, you add those two together, so you get the average of 11.05 for the long haul um, of, of, what, um, of, of what stock investors can expect. Um, in the middle here, we're looking at the amount of earnings that companies actually generate and it turns out um, that if you subtract dividends from earnings, which should in theory give you the plowback rate, the plowback rate for the long haul, 1930 through 2016, um, was 3.19%, which is almost exactly the same as inflation. In other words, companies during that, that period of, what, 87 years, um, Generally speaking, only plowed back enough to make up for what inflation turned out to be. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Notice, though, that the plowback rate for 2000 through 2016 is down to 0.49%. And that's attributable to the fact that, first of all, returns are lower, 4.6% in terms of earnings yield as opposed to 7% for the long haul period. Um, dividends are also much lower. But notice repurchases are, are, are way higher. Repurchases don't really, I've got these stars here because they don't really even exist uh, before about 1985. And so you can't really calculate it for the long haul number. But since 2000, uh, since the year 2000, um, companies have distributed one way or the other $4.11 or 4.11% of earnings compared to the total of earnings of 4.6%, which um, now in a way that's kind of a it's kind of a hopeful thing in many in many respects because it suggests that distributions are really quite high. Companies do not hang on to a lot of their money. Um, but it also means that the plowback rate is very low. If the plowback rate is only 0.49%, 49 basis points, um, and going all the way back to the Gordon Growth Formula, since plowback is what matters, plowback is what is the only predictable source of growth, strikes me that rather than the 5% we've been using, that the courts have been using from time to time, it's actually more like 3, 3.5% in more recent years, rather than using those numbers, the number should be something like 49 basis points instead of 350 or so, 300, call it what you will. Um, I think that that's where this whole thing is coming from. Courts have been too optimistic 
or, or it's not the courts really either. The odd thing about this is that experts on both sides of appraisal proceedings, both the plaintiff and the defendant, petitioner and respondent, um, have generally agreed. A uh, little, little anecdote. I mean, they generally, they, they, they haven't totally agreed on growth rates, but they've debated growth rates that are very high. One guy might say it should be three, the other one says it should be five, the court settles on four. I, I don't know why, why, I think it's just because Roger Davidson says it's inflation plus GDP, and, and, and I don't think that, that whole, the logic of that holds up. Um, interestingly enough, the biggest appraisal case ever litigated uh, uh, was for Dell when it uh, essentially went private in uh, three or four years ago. Um, and the two experts there, um, I should probably be able to remember who they were, but it's neither here nor there. Um, one of the experts said that they thought the growth rate ought to be 1%, and the other expert for the petitioner, believe it or not, said they thought the growth rate ought to be 2%. And the court chastised both of them saying, those growth rates are ridiculously low. Where, where, where are you coming up with 1% or 2%? And then what the court finally said is, after throwing up its hands, said, well, I can't go with one because that's just way too low. I've never seen anything like that. I guess I'll have to go with two because that's what the parties, are, that's, that's the, uh, looks to me like the only reasonable number being suggested by the parties. Um, so the court actually said, you're not giving us enough growth in this thing. Um, and in any event, that even at one or two percent, the, the, the parties made out, I don't remember exactly what the bonus was in the, uh, in the Dell case. But anyway, that's my bottom line. My bottom line is that we, maybe what we should be looking at here is the actual experienced plowback rate on a market-wide average. Now, there might be some companies that can say, you know, we're going to plow back more than that or, or less. Um, but I don't see how, a, how an investor can reasonably expect anything very much different from what companies actually do or have been doing in the, in the recent past. So I think that's a lot of, I, I think a lot of where appraisal arbitrage comes from is that. So I'm just, I mean, we're, we're, yep, we're, we're out of time. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that was, um, a lot of this really isn't in that paper. This the, that paper is kind of a starting off point for uh, for what I, this, this stuff that I've been thinking about more actually since I got over here. Uh, so there's another paper in here that is basically, you know, um, uh, sort of it, it expounds a bit on this data that that, that I've collected in the meantime. Um, so that's that.